Christina Planick from the uh, Office of Microenterprise and Private Enterprise Promotion. I'm very excited to be doing this joint seminar today that's bringing together the AgriLinks and MicroLinks communities purposefully for the first time. Um, while these sister communities definitely have some overlap, I'm sure some of you are members of both, if you are only a participant of one and you're interested in topics like today, I encourage you to look at the other. Um, AgriLinks covers all things ag sector development, as you might guess, and MicroLinks covers inclusive market systems and finance topics. So for our next seminar series, next month, November 20th, we will be having a webinar on youth savings and the business and social cases behind um, pushing that momentum forward. Um, so enjoy today's seminar. Thank you. And for another quick introduction and to introduce our speakers today, I'd like to pass the mic over to Laura Chismo, who is a private sector advisor uh, with the USA Bureau for Food Security. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Julie, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today um, for this Ag Sector Council seminar focused on optimizing private sector engagement for smallholder impact within Feed the Future. Together with its partners, Feed the Future is delivering results that are reducing poverty and hunger in some of our, the world's poorest families. In this past year, Feed the Future has increased the value of agricultural products sold by farm households by $170 million dollars. We've enabled the use of improved technologies and management practices on more than 4 million hectares and increased the value of new private sector investment within the agricultural sector by more than $160 million. USAID's Bureau for Food Security's Office of Market and Partnerships Innovation leads private sector engagement within Feed the Future and strives to increase the productivity and profitability of smallholder farmers through market-led innovation and dissemination of technology <coughs> private sector partnerships, and policy reforms that address farmer risk and finance. We view our private sector partners as thought leaders who can bring crucial feedback, a fresh perspective, and innovative insights to the, the development table. We are excited about today's events that highlight just a small portion of our portfolio that work towards these goals. Our first presenter will be Robert DeYoung, who is the Technology Commercialization and Models Lead for USAID's Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation program implemented by FinTrack that promotes private sector engagement to commercialize technologies to smallholder farmers and enhance food security. He is the main author of our new guide from smallholders to shareholders, which focuses on pro providing useful tools and insights into inclusive business models that maximize smallholder impact, and we'll be presenting on some main themes of that guide. He is also a specialist leader within the Monitor Deloitte commercial practice in the social impact practice line. He has more than 20 years of experience and has held senior level positions in both for-profit and non-profit organizations. We will then have the pleasure of hearing from one of our private sector partners, Louisa Parker of Adco Corporation, about their strategy for reaching smallholder farmers. Louisa Parker is a manager of institutional funding and stakeholder relations for Agri Africa and the Middle East at ADCO Corporation and is one of our core partners within a USAID partnership to bring small-scale silos storage to smallholder farmers in Zambia through Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation. Access to finance for smallholders is often a missing link in our best-intended programs and partnerships. Today we will also hear from Tom Carroll, Treasurer of the Global Development Incubator and the Director of the Initiative for Smallholder Finance a USAID-supported multi-donor effort to de designed to demonstrate how specific products and services can expand the reach of financing for smallholder farmers. He will discuss this challenge and new trends in finding solutions to unlock the much-needed financing for smallholders. Tom has, <coughs> Tom has extensive strategic advisory experience in a wide range of industries, and his most recent agricultural sector experience includes comprehensive market analysis, both global and sub-Saharan here in African horticultural markets and the development of numerous private sector partnerships across a host of commodity markets. Thank you again for joining us today, and I will pass it over to Robert. Thank you, Laura, and good morning to all of you. And uh, good day to everybody who's online, and good evening as well for those who are in time zones very far away from us. And I'm delighted to be here. 
Um, as Laura mentioned, I'm going to provide a few highlights um, of the recent publication we launched last week entitled From Smallholders to Shareholders. Um, and then, of course, a lot of the deeper content will come from our two additional guests, uh, Louisa and Tom, who will get into some of the nitty-gritty aspects of some of the things that I'll be speaking about more generally. So I thought I'd begin with a pop quiz. It's early morning. It's a rainy day. I thought some of you might like to kind of get your, your mind working a little bit. And I wanted to talk about a few misconceptions about working with smallholder farmers uh, in emerging markets. So I'd like to see a show of hands in the true or false um, as I go through the following slides. Show of hands, true or false. Smallholder farmers prefer cheap products. True? Show of hands. False? Correct. Smallholder farmers are actually willing to pay more um, for a product that is risk-free. They even don't like free products because they think because they're free, there must be something wrong with them. And a lot of people assume that they just prefer the cheapest thing out there. That's not necessarily true. <coughs> Second misconception. Successful models with smaller farmers are high volume, low margin businesses. True? Show of hands? False? In this case, it, it depends actually. Some of the models are high volume, low margin, but some of the other models are high volume, high margin. Um, and of course, the trick part is what's in italics, successful. We have seen successful models in both. Um, but increasingly, there's evidence to demonstrate that high volume, high margin businesses are possible when working with smallholder farmers. Smallholder finance is best done through banks and not companies. True? Show of hands? False? So this one is an interesting question. It's another one where it depends. And I think Tom, We'll talk a little bit about this um, towards the end of our session today. Um, this is a contentious point, um, and there are various perspectives as to what works best and what will get us to scale more effectively and more efficiently um, as we move more actively into smallholder financial models. Local regulatory issues do not interfere with low-income business models. True? Do not interfere. False. False? <laughs> Clearly they do. They do in many different ways. And the enabling environment or disabling environment can be a critical barrier to entry for many companies as they pursue these kinds of business models in emerging markets. Risk in low-income markets is very well understood, especially by private sector actors. <laughs> Especially. <laughs> True? False? Yeah, very good. Uh, indeed, it is not well understood. Um, and especially in new market entry strategies, they often entirely miscalculate what it's going to take to be successful and what the looming risks are, like what's beneath the iceberg um, when they enter those markets. And lastly, companies engage with small holders primarily to improve their reputation. True? False? It's not too long ago where CSR is what drove a lot of smallholder engagement. But increasingly, I think, the, the, the case for leveraging your core business and driving business growth through these kinds of models has been made. And so really, it's about making money. It's, it's in, the, in the core business interest to pursue these models in a number of different ways. So these misconceptions can often lead to failure. And here are a few of the failures that we've seen through some of the research we've done. Oftentimes, an inclusive business model with smallholder farmers can fail because the model is not mature enough. There may be some places where the model works, but maturity suggests that it should work in a variety of contexts, in a variety of geographies. In many cases, it has not yet been proven. And so the business model fails when it's a
adequate logistical and infrastructure. These are real barriers to entry that can inhibit the growth of many of these business models. Without logistics and the appropriate infrastructure, a lot of these models can often fail. Uh, lack of access to finance, and again, Tom will speak to this uh, during his session. There's increasingly a lot of social lenders engaging in this space, but the big question mark is around can commercial lenders move down market and move down market into rural areas, and how can they do that effectively? Um, so there still is an enormous lack of access to finance. The smallholder segment is not well served. And lastly, there is an underestimation of the degree of customization required. Many of the products and services that work in middle income or high income markets just don't translate to low income markets. Low income consumers and smallholders don't make purchasing decisions in the same ways that other markets do. And so the degree of customization is often woefully misunderstood and miscalculated, leading to a lot of mistakes that many companies can make in those markets. So after that bleak picture, uh, I'm not here to say that nothing works. Um, I'm also not here to say that business models are the panacea. But certainly there is hope. Um, there are things that are working, and I'll highlight a couple of those things. Obviously, um, this is not quite the Wheel of Fortune, but um, if all these things were happening, we'd probably not all be sitting here, but we'll be out drinking champagne and celebrating a lot more success. Um, but obviously, if we have better affordability, we have improved access to inputs of technology, we have improved distribution, productivity, access to finance, and market access, obviously, smallholder farmers would benefit immensely, and the companies who engage with them as well. So given that, what works and why? And the guide that we just um, launched last week talks about 11 business models um, that have been shown through case studies and otherwise to be somewhat successful. Um, of course, it all depends on context and some of the issues that I mentioned as misconceptions and risks um, that occur in many environments. Um, I'm not going to get into all the models, obviously, uh, because there's no time, uh, and it's hard to summarize six months of work into 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, if you go to the guide, you'll see many of these represented uh, in a very innovative way. So what we did um, as part of the guide was to try to provide a useful framework to think about and analyze business models. So we adapted the business model canvas to keep things simple and applied it to the smallholder context. Um, and so we have a business model canvas that covers these six elements. Really, you know, what's the company value? How does the company create value? How does it make money in some of these models? How does it go to market? How does the product or service get from point A to point B in the most effective manner? How do they do it? Um, how do they create smallholder value? So how does a smallholder win? Um, and what do they gain from that engagement? Uh, what is the customer experience like? So what's happening between the company and the smallholder? Is it direct engagement? Is it indirect? Is it using outsourced solutions? Is it insourced? Is it using different ways of engagement to be successful? And how does it scale and become sustainable? All questions that are very relevant to the kinds of thinking that underpins successful private sector partnerships. And lastly, we also speak a little bit about the role of the donor, like a USAID. How can a donor play a de-risking role or a role in accelerating the value of many of these business models as they get implemented through partnerships? So I'll pick one example. And uh, one example that we highlight is um, shared channel distribution. Sounds like a very technical word for something very simple. Um, but the idea is that businesses can, who have a difficult time um, getting to market can leverage the assets of someone else, of another player, to get their product to market more effectively and look for ways, innovative ways, of bundling their services. So they piggyback on existing distribution systems. They try to use a frontline sales force. There's high interaction between the company and its products and the end consumer, in this case, the smallholders. And it can leverage many value chain competencies. When we apply, obviously, the shared value canvas, as we call it, um, we, we can talk about the fact that it really helps reduce the costs um, for the company 
it can generate new revenue because it's a new way of delivering the product to market and growing a new market segment. Um, it increases access and affordability for the smallholder, so it can be very successful and useful for them as well. Um, and obviously, it can really enhance scale and sustainability because depending on the infrastructure and platform that they use, that might be something that has immense coverage um, in many rural areas. And so it can get to market more quickly, grow more rapidly, and it's a much more efficient way than doing it themselves. We also developed this sort of contextual assessment tool because, as I said earlier in my remarks, it always depends on the context. Context matters. And context will help shape and define the business model you use. And we try to come up with some of the key uncertainties that drive the choices you make when you think about the right business model you want to use in your different smallholder contexts. So in the case, in this case, um, we're looking at um, for shared channel distribution, four elements, the notion of you know, the complexity of distribution. If it's high, it's really how much control are you willing to give up to be able to have a better interaction with your end consumer. Because in this case, you're using someone else's distribution network, not your own. In the case of customization, how much do you have to change your product to be effective? The more you need to change it, the higher your cost structure. So how do you work that out? Do you localize that? Do you look, look for a third-party manufacturer? How do you think about that sort of customization that's required? What is the kind of behavioral change required? In shared channel distribution, um, as you'll see in the, next, in the next slide where we'll talk about an example, um, you'll see that the, the, the behavioral change was very, very light because it took advantage of an existing behavioral pattern of the smallholder farmer. And you'll see what I mean by that in a second. And the last is affordability. What's the right price point for the product or service? And how will that determine if it will be a real seller or not? Will it be competitive or not? So there's an example in India um, where there's a joint venture between MCX, which is a commodities exchange, and the Indian Postal Service. And the wonderful thing about this example is that the Indian Postal Service has infrastructure everywhere. Um, and they're able to reach um, many, many, many um, rural areas um, in ways that, that um, cannot be done normally. And MCX, being a commodity trading platform, wanted to be able to provide useful information to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of smallholders across India. So what were they able to do? Obviously, for the company, they were able to generate a whole new segment for sales and increase their profits while for the smallholders, they opened up a whole new world of information, um, of inputs, and a lot of bundled services that could be used around the postal service system. And lastly, what was successful about it was that they could leverage the last mile infrastructure that the postal service offered. Um, they could share these extensive networks, and they could play a role of aggregator. They could aggregate the demand that smallholders had, smallholders had for specific products. And in so doing, we're able to reduce the cost of those inputs, for example, um, and other services um, for the smallholder um, community as a whole. So one example um, of one element of, of their business model, um, they wanted to sort of they create awareness about the, the offering that GSK provides. So they've simply put a blackboard on the front of a postal, of a, of a post office in a rural area to really get a sense of what's the input demand. Um, they are given a 10% advance uh, to be able to say, I want X volume of, of whatever inputs there are. They consolidate all of those demands, as I said earlier, under one model, under one, one transaction um, with a number of different um, providers that they already work with, input providers. Um, they provide, obviously, they, they ensure that there's a much more efficient delivery of those solutions and products um, to the post office, they deliver it directly to the smallholder farmer, um, and on top of that, they also provide training. So it is a number of different models rolled into one, but fundamentally it is about leveraging an existing channel um, and using that intelligently as a company. So some key themes about what works within this context. And yes, the fingers did actually touch. Uh, you're not. <laughs> um, the, the first is that 
successful business models in this space should generally be high touch, meaning that there needs to be a lot of engagement between the smallholder and the company for it to be successful. And that means that things like extension and engagement and training are fundamental to success and to long-term success. The second is that you'll need to have a lot of innovative smallholder finance schemes. These could be everything from philanthropic capital um, to commercial transactions and commercial lending and everything in between. Tom will speak to some of these as well um, during his presentation, and Louisa will allude to them in hers. But obviously, it's a critical piece and often a missing piece in many of these business models. There obviously needs to be the aggregation of supply to have economies of scale. And if you're wondering what this is, these are not raisins. Um, these are actually stingrays um, aggregating somewhere in the ocean in the South Pacific. Um, I thought it was a really cool picture, so I thought I'd share it. Um, but it really is about aggregating supply um, to be effective in retail economies of scale. Most successful business models in the space require some degree of third-party facilitation. That could be a donor, it could be a nonprofit organization, another kind of institution that can play a role of ethical agent, that can create an environment of trust that can breed success. And in many cases, effective customer segmentation it's not just smallholders as one big group. There are successful segments within them that have to be prioritized and thought of in different ways. So the idea, as I said earlier, of the contextual assessment tool is that it's dynamic. No matter what business model we talk about or you look at, context will drive how it evolves and changes based on the market. That seems obvious to many. But in many cases, they believe that replication is really simple. Once we get it right here, it's going to work over there. That's not always the case. This kind of tool can help ask the right questions to help you think how one should adapt and customize given your local context. So some of the key takeaways, and I'll be wrapping up now, uh, given the short time that I have. Um, the first is that for successful private sector partnerships, or the notion of introducing innovation and technology in the context of smallholder farmers, getting the business model right is fundamental. Trying to do technology introduction in smallholder context without an appropriate business model is like trying to fly a plane without wings. We know what will happen. It goes up, it might look great, and then it goes straight down. Right? So it, it's really important to think about What's the right business model? And really understand what works. The second, as I mentioned repeatedly, context matters. It's fundamental. Understanding your context will really drive how you shape your business model to make sure it engages successfully. Third, it's fundamental to understand and manage risk. A lot of the roles that different stakeholders play is trying to de-risk the business model so that the right players come to engage. Finance can be crowded in the right private sector partners can engage. And so donors can, donors can and should think about their role as how to bridge the gap, create confidence and trust, and look for strategic ways of de-risking the investments that the private sector wants to make in these markets. Fifth, um, it's about establishing meaningful partnerships across sectors, not just public-private, but private-private, um, private civil society, and different mechanisms that can really make these models come to life. And lastly, it's about knowing your customer, understanding that smallholders behave and think differently than regular customers, and ensuring that the models are tailored to their specific needs. So to keep it simple, um, six A's, it's about understanding and creating awareness among the smallholder segment about the products and services, making sure those products and services can be made affordable, ensuring that they can be made available, um, to those markets, ensuring that they're accessible to those markets. It's making sure that it's acceptable, meaning that it fits within their behavioral norms and they're able to use it effectively, and that it's adaptable, adapted specifically to their needs and modalities. And if you want to learn more about some of these themes, um, you can go to partneringforinnovation.org you can download a copy of the guide. And I think we also have them on thumb drives 
just outside when you when you leave uh, today. It'll be available for, for print um, in the next couple of weeks. I'm looking at my colleagues. Yes. <laughs> so thank you for your time and for your patience. Uh, thank you, Robert. And I do want to encourage everyone. There will be there will be thumb drives um, on the desk when you leave. So please pick up a copy. And for those online at the webinar, please go to partneringforinnovation.org and download your copy. Um, I'm going to pass it off to our next uh, speaker, who's joining us virtually from uh, London, uh, Louisa Parker of Adco. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're trying to reestablish connection with Lisa. So we will jump forward and pass it off to Tom Carroll, and then uh, try again at the end with you. Great. All right. Uh, I'm going to stand up here, but if I start pacing like a cat, I will. Uh, <laughs> I will sit back down. Um, I don't uh, actually know the Lisa's slides, so I'm not going to try and present this. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll click through um, where hers are and get to what I think is uh, a narrower focus than what she was going to present, and it's really kind of diving into the work that we're doing right now um, around smallholder finance. Um, so uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on what the initiative for smallholder finance is and how it developed, how we're framing the market, and then kind of channel into one particular area of research um, to talk about and get a little bit closer to some of the successful models um, and then caveat what we mean by success. Um, the, uh, so the Initiative for Smallholder Finance is a platform for research and development um, of financial services for uh, the smallholder farmer market, and it's both um, donor organizations and capital providers um, and practitioners. Um, and just a couple of nuts and bolts of who we are, uh, we are a time-bound three- to five-year effort, and the idea was there is a um, there is an opportunity for market intervention here, but there isn't a requirement for setting up a whole new institution for this, and there is a way for a number of partner organizations in the market to get together um, and start coordinating some of their activities and sharing information and research in a different way. Three main things that we do. One, we research. Two, we facilitate actors in the market coming together. And three, we want to get into and have begun brokering really specific transactions that will help prove the model for how you move finance in this market and financial services. Um, and obviously, the goal of our market is um, to close that gap between what the market size we've identified as roughly $450 billion and the 10 to $20 billion in supply that's, that's out there right now. Um, I'm not making the claim that there's a $450 billion addressable market. Um, the addressable market's probably, you know, two to three times what's out there now, but then there's a whole lot of demand generation and market development activity that would need to happen to get to that broader number. Um, we got a ton of logos up there, so I'm going to go through a little bit of who's involved here. Um, the Global Development Incubator, I, in the reading of my bio, I realized I forgot to put in the whole decade at Dahlberg. Um, the, uh, the Global Development Incubator is a spinoff from Dahlberg Global Development Advisors. Um, and in fact, I was a partner there uh, for the eight years prior to this past September um, before I made the leap over to the public charity we set up to house initiatives um, and, and on one side of the house and on the other side of the house deal with social enterprise acceleration. Um, the initiative for smallholder finance is actually one initiative of, I think, six that we have within the incubator right now. Um, and it's the largest and most mature. Um, the, uh, we have a group of sponsors. Um, USAID is obviously one of them. These are our steering committee participants, uh, City Foundation, Skull Foundation, Ford, KFW, uh, and MasterCard. Um, the Gates Foundation has actually recently joined us as well, and we have an advisory committee. Um, we're sort of an official advisory committee, and that's Root Capital, TechnoServe, CGAP, Business Fights Poverty, uh, and Andy, the Aspen Network for Development Entrepreneurs. We actually have a whole host of advisors, but those are the ones that show up at meetings currently. Um, the, uh, a little bit of history. Um, in September 2012, we launched a report um, 
and this was back when I was a partner at Dahlberg, um, called Catalyzing Smallholder Agricultural Finance. And this was sort of the, what spawned the initiative. Um, and interesting, it, it comes from uh, a couple of different places. Uh, the City Foundation um, came to us, Graham McMillan, um, because they had been getting requests from managing directors on the commercial side of the house who were managing multinational uh, relationships um, in the food industry. And those multinational companies were coming to them and saying, we got smallholders in our supply chains. We don't really know what to do with them. There's a financial need here. Um, can you help us? And the MDs were saying, we have no idea what this market's all about. And so they tossed it over to the foundation side and said, can you put a frame on this market? How big is it? What's happening in it? Who's playing? Um, and how's it going to grow? Uh, similarly, the Skoll Foundation um, was looking to top off its investment in root capital, um, which is one of the social lenders, which we'll talk to in a second. Um, but Skoll's board had similar questions, which is, we love root, but what's their market about? Where's this going to be in 10 years? What are they growing into? And how do we see this model actually becoming scalable or sustainable? Um, so hence, the initiative was born. In that report, we laid out these five growth pathways. Um, and I'll take you through those very quickly and then talk about how that relates to how we're set up and the work we do. Um, the first, uh, well, the report itself, one thing we did, we, we kind of came out with a big number. Um, and that's the $450 billion. So we said, we did some consulting math um, and came up with how big is this thing going to be within the realm of reasonable. Um, so it was a swag. Um, but it was a calibrated swag. And the, uh, the second thing was talking through all of the constraints, kind of lining up who, in the, who are the actors in the space who are um, set against these constraints in an interesting way, um, and what's going to happen next. And then sort of next, looking forward, what are the areas for growth where we can really see some penetration for financial services to the smallholder market? Um, and you'll notice these are not actually mutually exclusive or comprehensive, um, but these were the ones that we thought uh, are most, most interesting. And it's a blend of business models, products, and actual customer segments. So the first one was replicate and scale the existing social lending model. Um, and who here is familiar with the term social lending? OK. So just a quick definition. Social lenders are the, they're actually the largest of them have formed a group called the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance. Um, and this is Root, Capital, Oika Credit, Triodos, um, Shared Interest, Responsibility, Alterfin, and Rabobank. Um, and they're the ones that have traditionally provided trade capital to cooperatives. And that's been their, their target market with a heavy concentration in export cash crops, um, the, uh, in particular coffee in Latin America. Um, and, but they have. Uh, worked out a business model that has been successful in the past. They've been growing their penetration in that market. Um, and the idea was where, from a commodity perspective and from a geography perspective, do they need to replicate and grow? Uh, the second area was, uh, let's look at a, the product portfolio. And there's obviously a big need for long-term lending um, to the smallholder. And by long-term, we had to come up with a definition. So we said anything longer than 12 months. And what we're really talking about here were renovation loans um, and some sort of asset finance. Uh, the third was, um, and this is called financing the outgrower screens of multinational buyers, but this begins to get to that question that Robert was talking about earlier, which is, do you want to be using third parties to provide finance, or do you want them to actually be going directly through and working with the multinationals who have their own trade finance portfolios? And there is an if-when question. Um, whether the multinational is the one that's best positioned to provide that finance, or actually if they've capped their growth related to what they want to do from a banking or financial service perspective, and they need a third party to come in. How do you know? When do you know? Uh, the fourth area was around alternate aggregation points. Um, when we first set this out, we thought we'd be looking more at warehouse receding. Um, and obviously, a ton of work's being done on that. So I think we're going away from that a little bit rather than reinventing the wheel. Uh, and looking more at what are the input providers doing um, and the, the network that they have set up. Are there opportunities to do point of sale and transactional work within the input providers' networks? Um, and last piece was on uh, finance direct to farmers. And so we want to make a clear distinction here. What we're talking about is the third party finance providers who are trying to do 
um, excuse me, direct lending to um, farmers. So it's some adaptation of microfinance models is kind of a good way to visualize it, but there's a whole host of different business models that are trying to get after this right now. Um, as distinct from what the input providers might be doing, which also might be direct, um, or what the multinationals might be doing, which also might be direct. This is the third party piece of it. Um, so we, over the summer, now continuing into the fall, we had a, uh, a research and design process. Um, and so we created a database of roughly 160 organizations um, in consultation with CEAP, uh, organizations who are actually financial service providers of these types of, um, of services. Um, and one thing I should say, we had a really heavy credit bias when we started out on this. As soon as we got to this area of the world, credit bias fell, it's credit savings insurance. Um, and now when we start to do some of the ideation around new products and services, uh, we're talking more about blended financial services. Um, what is the real need and use within the farmer household? Um, and how does that cross or combine what has tr traditionally been credit savings and insurance products? Um, so we had a large research effort to try and figure out what's happening here. Um, and then we had a design effort where we got uh, a whole host of practitioners in the market. Um, and this was anywhere from uh, financial service providers themselves to data firms to uh, MNOs um, to some funders. And we, we led a two-day human-centered design workshop. Um, and the idea here was similar to this questionable idea of success. Um, Inherently, in a lot of these models, they're not built to scale and they're not currently commercially sustainable. So how do we tease apart what's happening in the marketplace right now in terms of here are the key challenges that we're getting after? Um, what are the key areas of experimentation that's actually in the market, so a bit of knowledge sharing? And then lastly, if we take some of those experiment experimental models, what's the next generation look like um, along these key dimensions of areas where you can affect the business model in a way that it might be sustainable and scalable. Um, so very quickly, uh, I don't know if any of you have been through the human-centered design process um, before, but um, depends on how it's structured, but you throw a ton of ideas up on the wall. A room like this would be plastered with hundreds of ideas. And we went through that. So this is kind of a collapsing of that. Um, and we came up with five areas where a lot of the ideas seem to cluster. Um, one is in field efficiency, um, and this is talking about uh, field and branch-based delivery as key drivers of operational costs, what's happening to try and lower those operational costs. The second was around agronomic learning, um, kind of a funny point that relates to Robert's um, kind of more comprehensive look at what's happening with the smallholder market. You know, this was a uh, financial service human center design two-day workshop. Um, so we got all these ideas up on the wall, and I kind of leaned to one of my partners and said, something about finance up here. The, uh, all of the challenges that they had identified were kind of around the financial service and product, but how do we solve these problems that are inhibiting, you know, what are pretty commodified or standard ways of doing and interacting uh, financial services. Um, so agronomic learning is obviously a key one of those codependencies um, that can also help um, Enhanced productivity, obviously, that does wonders for your um, repayment and risk profile. Credit assessment, how do you score smallholders? Um, how do you have enough information to score and understand what the real risk is going to be? Um, fourthly, portfolio diversification. A um, lot of discussion, particularly around different crops, of the lumpiness of the cash flows within the farmer uh, household. How do you design around that, both from a product and service portfolio, but then um, how does the financial institution think about their portfolio and managing risks within that lumpiness? Um, and lastly, individual motivation. A lot of this is done through, through group work um, and group incentives. So within those group structures of lending, how do you incentivize individuals? Um, and what kind of uh, adaptations can you make to the model to make them more sustainable? Um, and what I'll do is just quickly take you through a couple of the experiments that are out there and they're pilots. Um, they haven't been taken uh, taken to scale yet, but then move that to, 
right, what is the ideation process then kind of get us thinking about going forward? Um, the first was in infield efficiency. Um, obviously, there's a big digital component to this, and there's a whole lot that's happening in terms of uh, both mobile information and mobile payments. Um, and so, you know, very tangible examples of this. Uh, one acre fund, um, they're using loan repayment, using mobile money. Um, so what does that do? Uh, you know, from a supply side perspective, big part of the cost driver, you need these high touch businesses. How do you have the high touches without the costs that are associated with them? And how do you, how do you better your field ratios, um, which is the number of field officers that you have that are um, touching the number of farmers? Um, and that's what actually can make the whole model uh, get closer to um, operational break-even. Um, pushing that one level further, Opportunity International um, currently has mobile van branches um, where they're actually bringing the financial services outside of the large towns and bringing them to uh, communities in rural environments. This has been really successful, in fact, so successful that they've uh, developed an offshoot of this where they're using containers and they're dropping a bank um, in some of the communities. So these are obviously already getting to some of the issues, um, but how do you take that one level further? So there's a whole lot of applications that um, are built right now or being built for larger cooperative structures. How do you drop that one level lower to the farmer, um, the farm group leader, so that you can offload some of those um, administrative tasks and make the communication with the individual farmers a whole lot smoother? Um, and again, We've got a slew of these next generation ideas. Um, just in the interest of time and some Q&A, I'll hold it at that level. Um, next area, when we talk about um, agronomic learning, technology assisted training for farmers, this is clearly happening. In uh, one of the asset-based financing models, Jehudi Kalima that, that uh, Robert mentioned, um, they're getting into video training by tablet. Um, so they're arming their field officers with tablets they can go in and um, actually use non-text-based examples of how you do some of this better um, agronomic practices. Um, and similarly, Safaricom and ICAO, um, the they've got agricultural tips by SMS. Um, and they're doing this in a, in a number of different markets, uh, and they're able to customize it. Um, and as you can see, it says three Kenyan shillings per SMS. Um, so there is actually a revenue stream coming out of this as well for them. Uh, not break even yet, but getting there. Um, and again, this is one of the low margin scale businesses. How do you take that further? The, uh, so if you think about the Jahudi tablet, what if Jahudi actually had, the Jahudi field officer had access not just to that video, but a whole repository of content um, and could customize the experience with the farmer. So you don't actually homogenize your farmers because we know they all have unique learning needs. You can come up and say, okay, it's actually financial literacy that we need to talk about today rather than your agronomic practices. Here's the module that I can pull up and give you for that. Um, we have a ton of different NGOs and learning partners in the space. How about we collapse some of that learning into a place where the field officers can access it? Um, again, interesting time. I got the high sign. Uh, there's a whole lot happening in this space. So I think the key takeaways here are um, this is a key part of the problem. Uh, it's clearly not the only part of reaching smallholders. Um, there's a whole lot of success in terms of how do you reach and impact smallholders when it comes to financial services. I think there's a whole lot that needs to be done if you talk about success defined not as reach and impact, but success divide, uh, defined as um, sustainably commercial organizations um, that are rapidly increasing that penetration rate of the smallholder farming community. Um, I think the third point would be um, there's a ton of innovation here. Um, and so this, move, this market where it is today, uh, even when we got started two years ago, it's an entirely different place. So with that. Thank you, Tom. And let me just um, check, do we have Louisa Parker? Online. Yeah, hi, you have Louisa here. Dial back the PowerPoint to your first slide. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you're joining us from today. Uh, yeah, my name's Louisa Parker. I work for AGCO. I'm the manager for institutional funding and stakeholder relations for Africa uh, and Middle East region. Uh, it's great to be joining you all today. Um, I was really asked to talk to you uh, about three areas, really, um, on behalf of AGCO. Firstly, to give you a very quick overview of AGCO's strategy in Africa. Uh, secondly, to talk a little bit about some of the specific projects that we're working on, uh, the future farm concepts, and particularly Bags to Bulk, which is supported by USAID and the Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation. And then lastly, I guess, to provide um, an overview of the challenges that we're facing as private sector in the market in relation to introducing sustainable mechanization. So very briefly, with regards to AGCO, for those of you that aren't familiar with the organization, we design, manufacture, and distribute agricultural machinery through our five core brands that you can see on there on the slide just there. Uh, Challenger Fence, GSI is our grain storage brand. Matty Ferguson, our global brand, probably the best known, and many of you I'm sure will have heard of Matty Ferguson, uh, and Valtra. Um, Vision is high-tech solutions to professional farmers feeding the world. And I should say that this is as, as much relevant for Africa as for many other parts of our business. Africa is one of the regions where we've seen the most growth actually in recent years. So AGCO, we're the largest pure play agricultural manufacturing company worldwide. Um, by pure play, we're not in the construction industry. We don't get involved in anything uh, to do with agro-processing. But we do provide a full line of agricultural equipment. Uh, tractors are probably best known for combine sprayers, implements, uh, grain storage equipment, and hay and forage tools. And we interact primarily in the market through a network of independent distributors and dealers. And we have around about 3,100 dealers worldwide. Uh, and many of the, pretty much every country in Africa, I think, is covered, or bar one or two. So um, AGCO's strategy for Africa, it's very much about um, providing um, solutions to uh, African farmers. Our strategy, our current strategy was developed around about three years ago and is founded on the four pillars that you see there, um, products, future farms, local footprint, and finance. And so I go more into detail on product and future farms in the coming slides. But on local footprint, just to say um, we've invested quite heavily in this um, as a manufacturer actually having a presence on the continent. We have an office in Cape Town, a dedicated parts warehouse in Johannesburg, um, our future farm in, in Zambia, and we've entered uh, recently a joint venture with the Algerian government for the assembly of Matthew Ferguson tractors um, in, in Algeria, specifically for the Algerian market, but in the longer term with a view to exporting to the rest of Africa. On finance, we have a partnership with Standard Bank in South Africa. We have other partners at country and project level, but I guess for, 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 for our strategy, this is still one of our greatest challenges uh, and an area where we still have um, some, some way to go. So in September last year, uh, Dr. Rob Smith joined AGCO as our new senior vice president for the region, for EAM region, um, with a very specific remit to develop AGCO's markets, particularly in Russia and particularly in Africa. So under Rob's direction, we are now in the process of refining our Africa strategy and for the first time having a specific strategy for emerging farmers, which I think is, is really positive. And it's no surprise to any of you um, on, the, on the chat today or in the room there that um, the majority of our farmers in Africa are smallholders. And I noticed earlier some of the chats, uh, people were saying, okay, well, what's the definition of smallholders? It's not a one-size-fits-all. And absolutely, I agree with that. And, and certainly for private sector, this is one of the challenges that we have when looking at this market in particular. So you'll see that we, uh, how we do this at AGCO, we break down the, uh, the, the Africa farmers into four segments, um, smallholders, broadly into subsistence and emerging. And then we have mid-sized domestic agribusiness and uh, large-scale commercial farmers. And the numbers across the bottom are, are the, the segmentation based on the numbers that we've pulled uh, from the Zambia market. And again, it shows how you can sort of break these down at country level. Um, I think the challenge for AGCO and for our, uh, for our distribution, particularly when introducing mechanization, is to look at who are the fastest adopters of technology, um, but in a way that maximizes the opportunity to trickle down to the smallholder or to the subsistence farmer. And so an example of this would be targeting lead farmers, 
or even local entrepreneurs at community level to then act as contractors um, and provide services to those around them. And often it's those lead farmers and those people within the community that have the local networks and understand how best to get these services to the smaller farmers that perhaps can't afford to buy uh, machinery themselves. And there are many models. It could equally be identifying bankable or viable farmers organizations and supporting them with access to mechanization. So how are we doing this? Well, uh, I guess first and foremost, um, our strategy has to start with product. So having a product that's suitable to the market, that's competitive in terms of its ability and its quality and, and of course on price. We now have a dedicated team looking at mechanization packages. Um, and, and we're talking about packages here that address all parts of the value chain where Agco product uh, touches the farmer's operation. And actually, this seems like quite a simple thing, particularly from a machinery company, but it's actually quite a step change within the business. Um, our starting point now is very much that the customer wants to put a seed in the ground and end up with a services um, to mobilize private sector capital towards opportunities that can generate both economic and social impact. Um, it works within the agricultural sector, but has the opportunity to work outside um, the agricultural sector as well. Um, it's a market-driven approach, and it, it will provide such services as investment identification and promotion, investment facilitation, including negotiation um, of business-to-business -business value chain partnerships, and deepening financial sector engagement in developing markets. Um, Elizabeth Diebolt is on the webinar and will um, include some more information on how to follow up with her specifically on investment support program. She is a USAID manager. And if you have any uh, for the people in the room, uh, please feel free to come up uh, to me after the webinar if you would like more specifics. But I imagine uh, this just began earlier this month, so I imagine in the next month or two uh, you will start seeing more information. Um, but this is just um, one um, other way that our office is trying to engage in this increasingly important uh, sector in international development um, with uh, engaging the private sector and finding strategic ways to de-risk their investment. Do we have Louisa back yet, or should we move on to Q&A? OK, so I'm going to pass it, the mic over to uh, Julie. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And thank you very much to our speakers. And um, if we get Louisa back, we'll see if we can patch her in. Uh, but we have about 25 minutes or so for Q&A with our speakers. Um, so we'll go ahead and move into that. And I also, just before we start Q&A, wanted to um, ask that if you have the opportunity to fill out the survey on your chair, that's always very helpful for us to uh, help improve our events going forward. Uh, if you have to leave early, just feel free to leave it on your chair or drop it on the front table. Uh, outside. And traditionally, we start with a question from our online audience. So I'll throw it back to our webinar team in the back and uh, see if they have the first question. Yes, uh, and there are 180 people joining us online from all over the world. So thanks for tossing it to the webinar audience. We, the first question is from Alexis Giannotis. And I'm sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that. Can you expand on your point of effective customer segmentation? What do you think about segmenting, e.g., crop productivity, productivity and behavioral, and how is that applied in thinking of customized approaches? That was a question for Robert. <laughs> oh. um, of course, I think that that um, Louisa spoke to this a little bit. I think Tom did as well. Um, smallholder farmers are not just one massive market. Um, there are different ways of segmenting the market to tailor your products and services uniquely to their needs. Um, and the better you understand those needs, um, either by applying um, different methodologies from ethnographic research uh, to others, um, the better you're able to be successful in those markets. So it could be everything from you know, segmenting you know, based on geographic regions, segmenting based on um, um, rain-fed or non-rain-fed regions, segmenting based on um, degree of, uh, of plot, land size, plot size. Um, there are a number of different ways to cut um, that fruit, um, as, the, as the visual suggested. Um, and, and I think the point really is that it's about segmentation that will drive the types of successes you can have. And, and maybe I think Tom can speak to that in the context of, of finance as well. Yeah, uh, certainly. And um, uh, part of the work that we've done, actually, we're, we 
particularly as it relates to direct farmer, um, we're using C-gap segmentation. That's pretty rudimentary segmentation um, because the, the theory being there is a whole class, I think, as uh, Luis referred to them as emerging farmers um, who are actually pretty well served in terms of their financial need. Um, these include some of the export cash crop smallholders um, that are actually, and those who have, uh, you know, larger than the, the standard um, two hectare plots. Um, so again, beginning to think, you know, n along a number of different dimensions, uh, who is it that you're targeting and what you're trying, what, what behavior you're trying to affect. Um, one thing I'd, I'd call your attention to, um, you know, prior to my life focusing on agricultural, uh, to fin financial services for this community, um, I did actually, what I did at Dahlberg was uh, help develop and grow their uh, agricultural practice. Um, we did a project with the Gates Foundation uh, three or four years ago called Farmer Focus, and it was a very comprehensive national level survey of two different countries, one in Malawi and one in uh, Tanzania. And the idea was, is there a way to come up with a replicable customer segmentation so you can think about who you're approaching? Um, and so I think they did somewhere around 7,000 primary interviews. Um, and it was along what you had talked about in the question, Alexis. Um, the both uh, demographic information, um, but also there was a, uh, and we call it a skill well matrix. There was a huge behavioral element to it. Um, and there's a really interesting data set that's available through that work. Um, and it gets to how do you really need to think about those that you're targeting with um, goods and services. Uh, the good news was that we did it in two countries um, to see if there was compatibility and there were two very different contexts. Um, and from at least a statistical perspective, the consumer segments held. Um, and so there are types that you can see within the market um, that fall out along the skill will matrix. Um, and it does help with targeting. We have a question from our input tonight. Come over here. Um, and uh, in general, please state your uh, name and organization, if that's all right. Thank you. Uh, Christopher, how do you feel? Um, last week, I was at Georgetown, where the Secretary of Agriculture directly launched Rural Entrepreneurship Program with uh, the Global Social Value Enterprise Group of Georgetown. And I was wondering, do you have a space for basically exchanging your models internationally and inside the country, but there seems to be so much commonality, also it would be very useful if that would include 20 to 30 year olds, but there are not many 20 to 30 year olds in this room. And so generally, how do you share all of these models across these cross-connected interest groups? That's a great question, and uh, I think fortunately, Partner for Innovation has what's called the AgTech Exchange, where we'll actually bring to life the models guide. Um, by webifying it in terms of not just having it be a PDF document, but a community around which other people can add their models. And we also are integrating a lot of additional resources and information of where we got our own research from in terms of where existing case studies exist. And the idea that over time we can have virtual community discussions and webinars that can start to increase that body of knowledge, because I agree with you, it's often fragmented um, out there. Um, and the idea is to try to bring as many of them together, um, either through that platform or through Hagerlinks and, and others as well. Um, but totally agree with that, with that concept. We had a we had an interesting uh, happenstance. Uh, one of our uh, program officers from the Skoll Foundation relayed a story that um, they had been in a meeting. Um, it was, maybe it was a conference after a meeting um, with the San Francisco Fed. Uh, and the San Francisco Fed is actually responsible for administering the Community Redevelopment Act requirements of the local banking community. Um, and they were looking at smallholder farmers in Northern California, and somehow they had gotten a hold of our report. Um, and we're using the five growth pathways, but in the context of the Northern California farmers. Um, and that honestly was not an idea that had dawned on us at, at the time, because we've been more focused on the emerging markets. But the idea for uh, these models um, walking across different geographies or irrespective of um, whether they're emerging and global, uh, I think it's a very important one. We'll pass it back to our online audience. This question from Joe Vila Rocha of ADRA International. And I agree 
agree that getting the business model right is essential, but to what extent should donor projects take the role in closing the gap so smallholders are more business oriented? Should we just leave it to the private sector to help them? I think that's also a very good question, and, and uh, the notion of what role should a donor play is always a very important question that donors are thinking about. How, how far is too far? Are they subsidizing too much, and where can the private sector really engage um, with their own resources? And it's a fine balance. Uh, I don't think there is a perfect answer. I think different donors will look at this issue of how to de-risk and how to subsidize in different ways. Um, but I think many of the newer developments in, in donor communities is about leveraging um, and, and actually ensuring that the companies put their own skin in the game. And that is a way of trying to say, look, we're in this together. We're not, it's not just here to help you um, and provide you with all the subsidy to cover all of your additional costs that would require you to enter this marketplace. So I think it's about finding that right balance, and I think that at least the later developments in development finance uh, um, have been moving in that direction and looking at more effective leveraging schemes. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, actually, and, and kind of further it and say, I think kind of the next generation of what's happening, at least in the financial services community, there needs to be some thought given to how do you move the incentives for participation closer to those who have immediate um, interest in what's happening with that local smallholder farmer community, and that includes both the multinational corporation or even if it's not multinational, you know, a regional uh, player within the supply chain, but also the local government. Um, and there's a big, you know, kind of a follow-on open question and something that needs to be resolved is what is the role of the policy environment, and again, setting up the right context for this, um, and any sort of subsidy regime uh, longer term. We did a piece um, looking back at, uh, it was a historical comparative analysis of the U.S., South Korea, and Germany. Um, one of the reasons we did this piece is because I had no reference point. I was like, what's what's this supposed to look like if we get it developed? Or are we in such a different world now that it's going to be completely different no matter what? And the interesting thing is, and I think this is no surprise to the people in the room, uh, in each of those markets, um, subsidy and policy support never went away for this particular part of the market. Um, and so one thing that needs to be brought into this discussion is what is that advocacy agenda look like locally, um, but what are the right policy structures and or subsidies that are required to have effective commercial participation, particularly around the financial service community? A question from our in-person audience. Thank you so much. My name is Anita Campion. I'm with Connexus Corporation. We organize the annual Cracking the Nut Conference. Um, our next year's event is going to focus on addressing challenges amid climate change uh, to expanding rural and agricultural markets. So I'm curious to know from both of you of kind of what you see as the likely implications as climate change is making things even more difficult uh, for predicting agricultural markets. Uh, and you know, one thought I have was say, you know, should we be looking at ways to leverage the playing field for agribusinesses to other businesses by providing, say, public insurance that would cover, you know, index-based insurance, for example, or you know, do you have any other thoughts on kind of from your own, your wealth of experience on that? <laughs> the puppy. <laughs> yeah. um, the, uh, uh, so we are exposed on what are the effects of climate, ex climate change on financial service provision to smallholders. We haven't looked hard enough at it. I'll just be completely honest. Um, and in fact, I, I was talking to Doug Pond from Opportunity International about being on a panel at your conference, and I said, I think the Dahl Dahlberg could go deeper on this than the Initiative for Smallholder Finance could at this stage. Um, obviously, there are huge implications for how financial service providers are going to need to think about risk. Um, the, uh, and yeah, I do think there is uh, a potential role for um, sponsor for subsidized insurance products. I'm not sure that there is anybody to step up and do that at scale at this point, um, but it is something that we need to go further into and think about. Um, obviously, the effects on the financial service um, world are not just around the risk of their loans, um, their own risk assessment. Obviously, there are much broader impacts that we need to think about in terms of what is the impact on the smallholder community outside of what might worry a bank or a financial institution. And, and just to add a little bit, um, to some degree as well, um, 
Yeah, there are two answers to that. I think part of it is also, you know, looking at climate smart agriculture and what are practices that can really ensure certain degrees of resilience for smallholders and what that might mean. I wonder what that, that, that implies in terms of education and awareness raising um, for the smallholder community. And of course, on the other side is the issue of how do you figure out what's the right insurance scheme that can look at those issues more holistically, as you suggest. And it may be about, you know, bundling pro private, public, and looking at other incentive schemes that can try to address that issue. But I would agree that there isn't yet the proverbial solution that can really be at scale, I think, in the market as of yet. One, one caveat there, I'm actually I'm now recalling the conversation with Doug. The, um, you know, some of the, uh, some of the same concepts, and this is both from an agronomic practice perspective, but also from a financial service pr perspective, um, that have been talked about in the context of just creating a more efficient business model actually have knock-on benefits for when you think about that in the context of climate change. So I think uh, it, there needs to be just a shift of the lens to say, okay, we've been thinking about things like um, tillage and some of the other productivity enhancements. Uh, thinking about them in the context of how does that increase productivity at a lower cost longer term, um, and then how do you finance uh, the materials that we require to do some of those practices, thinking about it as a long-term business model efficiency play rather than there's a climate change play here. And I just, you know, was, we have not done the work to do that, to line it up and say this is what's going to be effective here and this is the implications of it. I just wanted to add uh, quickly that our, our office has separate um, initiatives and one of our Food Future Innovation Lab uh, specifically works on weather-based index insurance pilots um, and working through the difficulties of uh, measuring basis risk to get um, quality insurance products for smallholder farmers that do um, protect them from, from risk. We've also recently partnered with the World Bank, um, which is um, starting to pull together a field of experts uh, to, to um, think through some of some of these challenges moving forward. There are several private sector index-based insurance providers that are beginning to saturate some of the smallholder market, um, but there's still more work that needs to be done in structuring uh, high-quality index insurance products for smallholders. Right, so we'll toss it back to our online audience and then come back to the in-person room. Thank you. This question comes from Steve Lynn, Independent Consultant in Vermont. farmers' ability to afford financial services is directly re related to their market, can you speak about tying financial service provision to market outlets? Uh, I'm not 100% sure that I understand the question, to market outlets. Um, and I'm not sure if the distinction that we're making here is between tight value chains and loose value chains. Um, the uh, so, and hopefully I'm answering this question um, most successfully or most accurately, and also successfully. The um, <laughs> uh, most of what's happened in the smallholder finance community thus far has actually been where there is a direct tethering to buyers and market outlets, um, and that's largely what's been financed. Um, regardless of whether it's at the cooperative level or actually you're going down to the direct to farmer model, which is the, the trade finance is actually run off of um, the, the buyer's note, uh, and that's kind of the cap on, on the receivable. Um, the, uh, and that's been more successful in export cash crops where there's a more predictable buying market and uh, the margins are better. Uh, I think what we're seeing, the second part of that would be the market act outlets um, and the ones that are of more interest for the smallholder community, as the bulk of the smallholder community, um, would be those market outlets that are locally or regionally based. Um, and I think that's where our work is actually is moving toward, which is how do you think about the financial service provision um, in the context of these local commercial cash crops that are not export cash crops necessarily, um, that do provide income for the smallholder. Uh, and I think that's the next generation for us. As we think about the markets that have been that we've approached and the way that we set up our rubric here, export cash crops were obviously the lead in, and that's where the social lenders largely play. Um, but we, that was only 10% of the market for smallholders, and we said we're missing the 90%, uh, and we've got to get after the 90%. So we need to understand 
and a much deeper and local level, what is the relationship between the smallholder and the market outlet? Three questions over the Ed Bresen from the World Bank. Uh, one of the aspects, getting back to your point initially, uh, Robert, about policy, okay, whether it hinders or facilitates, uh, and uh, Tom, you mentioned subsidy schemes, for example, in terms of possibly crowding out effective finance and maybe a business perspective as well. And I understand that getting into the policy discussion is unique for almost every country because context really does matter. But where has, if you can give a few examples, say, of technology policy, innovation policy, where it has facilitated or where it can be a facilitator uh, in ag finance uh, or in access to inputs, whether it's machinery, seeds, other types, and perhaps where there are, is a, a policy vacuum or where it's been a hindrance. I um, appreciate that. Thanks. Before I, I, I joined Partner for Innovation in Deloitte, uh, I was working with the government of the Philippines. Um, and they were looking at how to incentivize inclusive business models, not just in agriculture, but more broadly. And one of the things that we identified as an issue was looking at trying to leverage tax amnesty as a way in which to incentivize companies to move down market. Because as many of us know, in emerging markets, um, the tax regimes are not well enforced, um, and most companies are not historically paying their taxes. So they owe a lot of money uh, uh, to the government and hope and pray that the government will never come knocking on their door and try to collect. So that's a big fear and it's it's on their balance sheets in some way as sort of a, a, a big risk. If you can play with that from a policy perspective in terms of an investment model, um, they were quite open to rethinking and using tax amnesty, saying we'll forgive all of your previous debt to the government if you move more proactively in these kinds of business models, um, which makes sense for you because you can grow your business in, 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 in these sort of customer segments um, or new market segments, and it helps create a more inclusive growth strategy for the country overall. And um, that's one example that I thought was really interesting that I never thought that tax regimes would come into this conversation, but it was something that I thought was useful to, to share. The, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that one. Um, and you're from the World Bank, so you probably know this, but for the broader group, there's actually a group that's coming out out of the Doing Business Better um, part of the organization is going to be looking at policy regimes um, and doing some sort of uh, data-based indication of who's doing it better, who's doing it worse, so you actually understand a little bit more about the context um, going forward. Uh, and I'm certain that there will be technology uh, technology indicators included in that data set. Uh, a question from online. Thank you. Uh, Tom, you did interpret that question correctly. He was looking for linking credit with buyer commitments. Um, this next question comes from Jeannie Harvey, Gender Advisor at USAID. USAID has made a strong commitment to addressing the needs and special issues faced by women farmers. Do these models make any effort to specifically address the needs of women farmers, including the special constraints faced by them? Uh, the models framework, there's a second layer of analysis um, that can look at many of these issues more specifically. Um, and I was thinking of, you know, one day if we do a next generation um, um, and as we go online and create sort of broader inputs to, to thinking about these business models more succinctly, um, there are those kinds of challenges and issues that I think could be made much more explicit and more relevant. Um, and I think um, the gender issue is definitely one. Um, and I think going to, having deeper dives on, on things like, uh, um, like mechanization, um, the inputs market, you know, post-harvest and storage, um, training and extension, what are the models that work specifically in those contexts beyond just sort of the overarching general models that seem to work um, more broadly in the smallholder context. So I definitely think there is room for that, but we did not consider that lens um, for this part of our effort because it's sort of the first brick upon which we hope to lay the foundation for more thinking um, at a more refined level. Uh, another question from our in-person audience? All right, pass it to Dan. Thank you. My name is Dan Silverstein. I'm an external um, private sector and capital markets advisor to uh, MPI. I don't hear a lot of talk about um, the money markets, the credit markets, and the capital markets. And, and they, it would seem that they play 
should play an essential role. There, as I was listening to your really excellent presentations, uh, it, it popped into my head that it sounds a lot to me like uh, it has the character of the Fuller Brush Man. You go from door to door, from from farm gate to farm gate, basically, with a kit uh, looking to provide services or to sell a product. In the industrialized nations, we have we've commoditized the the money markets by uh, facilitating short-term lending by corporations that have established credit ratings so that they can finance their receivables and do all kinds of short-term uh, lending procedures. Um, I don't see a lot of research about that. And so my question is, is there research about this? Who's doing this? Is the World Bank looking at this? Um, and, and is it feasible? Thanks. So the short answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is that a, are we good? <laughs> yeah. Um, yes or no question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and but what I can say is obviously that's a big question um, because you know as we've tried to break apart the market, I can speak to one example um, where it's happening. Um, so I mentioned the CSAF group, uh, the Councils for Smallholder Agricultural Finance and the Social Lenders, and one of the reasons they got together was to try and preempt what maybe happened in the microfinance industry uh, 15, 10, 15 years ago in terms of the ambiguity of uh, how those services were provided and the impact they were having, um, standardized some processes for how they um, track their own businesses. And one of the main intentions for that was so that it would be easier for the capital providers, those funding their businesses, um, to know what good looked like and to know what they were getting into. Um, there's another component of that um, for they themselves, which is uh, the information that, being, that is being tracked um, has a lot to do with what donors require in their markets, not necessarily what, from an operational perspective, would ease their doing business, um, something like a credit bureau. Um, and so that's kind of the next generation for them, um, which is thinking through uh, what do we need the information to do in terms of uh, our ability to make good loans and to attract capital to do so, um, and to give those who are funding us uh, greater security that they're making good equity investments in our organizations. I was thinking was, my question is somewhat of a corollary to the previous question about tax reform. My question was a corollary to this previous question about tax reform. It's all about the institutionalization, starting at the, at the sovereign level, down through the ranks in order to create this, uh, to facilitate lending. And, don't see a lot of that. What kind of things? Yeah, I mean, that's one aspect. One of the other part of this that we get into when it comes to sort of the, the next order of the capital markets, I mean, we, we talk about a lot with the direct farmer, it's about local distribution. Um, but some of what we're getting into are the financing vehicles that will allow the DFIs to get into this um, and the credit enhancement schemes. Um, and so, yes, that is happening. Um, Case in point, and maybe this goes further to answer your question, uh, part of the project that we did for long-term debt, um, there was a peel-off piece of it that was a relationship between KFW, one of our steering committee members, and a, and a um, global coffee organization. Um, and what they wanted to do was set up a Mauritius-based fund um, with some credit enhancement involved, and then the coffee distributor would actually set up the local distribution and get further into the value chain um, not crowding out the local commercial capital, but reaching parts of it that they couldn't get to yet. And so it was expanding their own trade finance portfolio with KFW, and hopefully with other partners, in which case it would move to Luxembourg, would be able to provide a facility for them where and a risk-adjusted facility to do so. Um, that's happening. And, and just to build on that, I did spend some time working with ADB and IDB on, on inclusive business models and thinking about inclusive business strategy specifically in, that, in the context of looking at some of those financing vehicles that go from the top to the bottom as opposed to what we've discussed today, which is much more from the bottom to the top. Um, and what I was surprised to learn that in the private sector portfolios of the larger banks, regional banks, there isn't a lot of agriculture. Um, it kind of fell out of you know, uh, flavor um, for a good two decades. And now it's slowly coming back because there's a realization that um, um, infrastructure alone is not going to solve poverty in many of these countries. Um, so there is some new thinking to say, well, can we use some of those facilities 
at the, sort of the meta level that can really sort of sort of ease risk and provide those credit enhancements um, to different um, lending institutions to help them move down market, especially in the rural context. And I, there's some hope there. I think there is some new appreciation for those kinds of vehicles moving forward. All right, well, we've reached the end of the hour, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. So let's give our speakers one last round of applause. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all so much for joining. Thanks to our very large online audience. And if you have any further questions about Ag Sector Council or about the content of this particular event, please feel free to email me, uh, Julie McCarty, jmccarty at usa.gov. I'll either answer it or pass it along to the right person. And hope to see you at our November seminar. Thank you.